Okay. I think to the, in the interest of time and everyone's um, interest in this incredible topic of community engagement in civic science, I will uh, get us started. Um, so hi, everyone. I will hopefully be on camera soon when I'm back at my location. I'm Grace Wickerson. I am the Health Equity Policy Manager at the Federation of American Scientists. And I was a part of leading the open science policy sprint that brought all of these incredible people together um, to write policy ideas that are tangible in improving uh, the open science ecosystem at the federal level and giving tangible suggestions for how to build uh, different areas of capacity. So this session where we talk really about um, the role of community in open science. And I think our my goal in designing this and working with all of the people here on the call who are gonna be presenting was to really think about community engagement in a, a broader lens. So not just you know communities as the receiver of uh, research products or research papers that are made open access, which is a you know great uh, tangible policy step this administration has made it's actually kind of goes beyond into how the community and the public can play a role in the research process and the research process itself can be opened up to all of these stakeholders that have um, ideas to share, uh, unique environmental, social and health challenges that are lack maybe the ability to be captured if it was just by the research community. And so I think there are ways that we hope to discuss today to effectively engage communities in the process of science, forging meaningful partnerships that span the research process, looking from idea conception to even the data interpretation process uh, to make an, a scientific enterprise that is more equitable. And so kind of a, the year of open science, which we're all celebrating here today, reaffirms the role of government actors in supporting open and inclusive science. And so we're just excited that you all are, are sharing this space with us, um, hearing about these great ideas from the Federation of American Scientists, the Center for Open Science and Wilson Center's Open Science Policy Sprint Accelerator, and um, hopefully kind of in, are inspired to think about the ways in which uh, we can foster community engagement in science and build this future inclusive research ecosystem that grounds our research and the research that we're investing in in diverse perspectives in real world context. So without further ado, I'll uh, give a mention to our speakers today. So first off, we have Amelia, Amelia Williams and Katie Hoberling who are from the Open Environmental Data Project. And they are going to be kicking us off to talk about their proposal on how to integrate community data into environmental governance. Then after that talk, we'll have a talk from Jeff Sheehy and myself uh, about how we embed co-production into health science research and build a model that actually can be scaled beyond just health research. And then we'll close into a moderated Q&A. And so everyone will be able to ask questions of the group. Uh, and I have a few prepared if people are shy and want to have some uh, inspiration before we jump into it. So. That's what we're looking at today. Um, I'm excited to get started. So Amelia and Katie, would you like to take it away with your presentation? Sure, thanks for introducing us, Grace. And thanks for the, the great introduction to the panel. Um, I think Amelia, you do you wanna share slides and we'll go through these? Yeah, one sec. I can start introductions while um, we're figuring out slides, but thank you everyone for joining us. Um, really excited to be here today. I'm Katie Hoberling. I'm the Director of Policy Initiatives at Open Environmental Data Project or OEDP. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about who I am. Um, I also, I, I wanna preface that I'm not a data scientist and I don't do much data analysis, but uh, we do the policy work that we do at OEDP is mostly around organizing and advocating for environmental and open data policy and, and kind of a shift in, in the way that we, uh, oh, sorry, it looks like we're having some sharing issues. 
sorry, one second. Let me try to do this. You can probably get mine to share, but I'll have to come out of Zoom and come back in. Mm. I So I am, I should be able to, but sorry, I just need to get the like right screen ready. Um, and for some reason, it's when I try to share, it's showing a very small view. Um, So this is, this is what I can, <laughs> this is what I can share. Let me see if I can, let's see, actually, is that better? I can just that looks great. bring this out a little bit. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so I'll just finish my introduction really quick. Um, yeah, I have a background in environmental science and policy. I, I previously managed an open science initiative at Berkeley. So very excited about this year of open science conference and, and all the work that FAS and Center for Open Science and Wilson Center are doing. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let Amelia introduce uh, yourself too. Yeah. Hi, I'm Amelia. I'm the research and policy associate at OADP. Um, I too am not a data scientist, but I do a lot of thinking and working about all the aspects of data governance and data stewardship. Um, my background is in climate environmental policy and science, and I previously worked at MIT in the Woodwell Climate Research Center. So happy to be with y'all today. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of um, background information about who OADP is, we really work to try to reimagine how we collect, use, and share environmental data. Um, and we really focus on how it's used and moves between different groups. So we can think about communities, government, and researchers, others as well. But those are kind of like our, our three, three big focus areas. Um, and we re really want to try to strengthen multi-sector approaches to this. Um, we understand that collaboration uh, is really key <coughs> to making this a successful effort. Um, so... Yeah, we're really thinking about how information can be shared in ethical and responsible ways between those groups. Um, and all of this stems from an acknowledgement that environmental pollution, disasters, and climate change, while they impact everybody, um, systemic racism and classism really amplify those impacts on people of color and other vulnerable communities. Um, so better data governance, we think, can make environmental knowledge more easily accessible, understandable, and usable to more people. So communities, researchers, and government, um, but we're also thinking about, you know, journalists, lawyers, other people who are kind of part of the fight and movement for environmental justice. Um, and we also believe that open data systems can and should center communities um, and that can, they can be used to empower, empower them and their allies to bring about better environmental policy and action. Um, I'll really quickly define community here because I know that we use that word a lot of people use that word quite a bit to use different things. So when we talk about communities, we're really thinking about local place-based groups of people who have a shared history. Um, and when we say open environmental data, we'll give you a quick definition of this too. Um, we try to think of open a little bit broader than kind of the binary of completely open versus completely closed. Um, we don't think that that is a invaluable way to think about openness and transparency, but we also support um, wider sharing of data that maintains the values and interests of the people involved. So easily accessible within ethical confines, privacy, sovereignty, especially in the case of indigenous groups, um, understandable mm -hmm. interoperability. So you can think of the FAIR principles here um, a lot of the time. And we also have a pretty broad definition of data. Um, so oftentimes we're thinking about air, water, soil quality, um, but also very descriptive and often observational um, information about people's lived experiences, um, whether in climate data, of course, population, demographic information, aerial imagery as well, photography and maps and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so this is not, shouldn't encompass every single kind of data that we think about, um, but just to give you a sense of kind of the broad definition that we use. Okay, so why are we here? Um, so we, I've mentioned that frontline communities often bear the brunts of environmental uh, environmental harms, which are created by climate change and pollution. They are also increasingly generating their own data through community science and monitoring efforts. So lots and lots of data sources are pr proliferating, um, but they're often overlooked uh, facets of open science. 
Um, we believe this data can provide really critical social and environmental context that isn't necessarily present in data that is, uh, you know, collected in academic research or agent by agencies. Um, and that there's a lot of momentum towards integrating this community generated data into science and governance. Um, one example, there's a lot of these, but one example that comes to mind recently um, is that of the Tonawanda Community Air Quality Study, which involved uh, community scientists who were collecting air quality uh, measurements uh, in, in the town of, Tano um, sorry, in Buffalo, New York, um, next to the Tonawanda Coke facility. Um, and they ended up partnering with a local state department to determine where the source was coming from, um, partnering with interested regulators and eventually grabbing the attention of the White House and the EPA and the Department of Justice. So this is a really successful example of community science. It's definitely not necessarily common, but we wanted to kind of show you a, a model of what this could be. Okay. Um, and also, I mean, a lot of this is probably not new to everybody here, but we, we want to acknowledge that there is a lot of investment recently in this kind of work. So hundreds of millions of dollars in the U.S. from the American Rescue Plan, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, particularly through the EPA, um, is helping communities run these community science projects and do their own monitoring. And there's indications that there might be more to come. Um, and then, of course, why we're here, the year of open science. And we really see that there is a connection between these two movements and want to try to figure out how to how to best leverage the, the alignment there. Um, the problem, uh, we've talked about a few problems already, but even though community science initiatives are uh, gaining momentum and proliferating, there are still a lot of hurdles and barriers to, to their data being used in governance. Um, they often face really complex uh, local and federal policies and dense, really, really dense legal landscapes. There could be uh, unclear standards for data and hardware, um, oftentimes conflicting reporting policies from public agencies. And even when there is interest, which we have, we have seen, especially in recent years, agencies and researchers often lack the capacity to find or integrate this data um, responsibly or, or in ways that are going to be effective for their work. So I'm gonna pass it over to Amelia to talk about what we can do about it. Yeah. So we propose that the EPA should better integrate community data into environmental research and governance. So what does this better integration look like? Um, what needs to happen to ensure that there's a, you know, a deeper saturation of community data into policy decision-making? can hit it, Katie. Um, and we really are focusing on the EPA here. Um, and we focus on three main recommendation buckets. So first off is building government capacity, facilitating connections between communities and addressing misaligned data standards. Um, there's a lot to unpack in each one of those buckets um, or circles. Um, and the main partner would be the EPA and specifically in most of these cases, the newly created Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that office coming up. So first off, um, thinking about building government capacity, uh, Katie kind of pointed to this like critical lack of coordination capacity. And that kind of leads us to our first recommendation, which is to create a memorandum of understanding to develop a collaborative framework between these um, agencies on the screen here. So we have the EPA, but we also have the USDS, the Office of Management and Budget, the NEJAC or National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and also the research funding agencies. So NOAA, NASA, NSF. Um, this MOU would really serve to develop a collaborative framework for building internal capacity um, for all things related to data. So generating and applying the data, sharing it, enabling its broader responsible reuse. Um, and we recognize that agencies um, can be siloed in their work and they're often incentivized to be siloed. And so this MOU really serves to de-silo the programmatic activities that are related to data um, and establish this partnership that really, um, I think of it as like a through line through a lot of the activities that we're gonna talk about next. And we have two other recommendations around building government capacity. Um, the first is developing and distributing guidance on responsible scientific collaboration. And the priority here would really be ethical open science and data sharing practices that make sense and center community and environmental justice priorities. Um, second off, it would be great to build a capacity building program that focuses on 
really creating these translational and intermediary roles within the EPA. So the priority here would be on building these roles so they can facilitate responsible sharing between data seekers and data holders. Um, much of the work that we see relies on this translation piece, um, translation of technical context or social context. And so that's why we kind of characterize these roles as translational liaisons. Um, they could be situated between the EPA and the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights, regional EPA offices and funding agencies like the one on the screen there. Uh, moving on to kind of our second bucket of recommendations. Um, this is all about facilitating connections between communities and is really focused on expanding the scope of the current environmental information exchange network, um, otherwise known as the EN, to include data from community-based organizations. So right now the EN is just a web-based information platform. It really facilitates environmental data sharing among the EPA, among states, tribes, territories, but currently community generated data is not really hosted or shared there. Um, and we want that to change. Uh, and we could change that by starting a working group to put in place to develop recommendations to you know, make best practices on how the network might accommodate community data. I think also providing grant funding for those community-based organizations so that they can effectively integrate their data into this platform. This could look like aligning data standards or you know, bolstering that internal capacity to deal with a new digital interface. Um, and lastly, we just really wanna expand the technical resources available for all the network partners that could support data quality assurance, advocacy, and training and sharing. Um, and this could be taken on by the aforementioned regional offices and their increased capacity from those translational liaisons. And our last bucket of recommendations really focuses on misaligned data standards. So we recommend that the EPA partners with the OMB and the USDS and to update and promote guidance for community-based organizations that want to use the standards that EPA uses for data in regulatory decisions. So. We suggest additional guidance as well as technical assistance because um, as we all know, I think data standards can be highly technical to use and adapt your data to. Um, and then we also have um, our last recommendation and we think that it might be useful to explore um, a co-design process for new data standards that could accommodate community generated data formats more readily. We are not quick to suggest new standards and quite reticent, actually. Um, there's already quite a few data standards and that might add to the confusion. It's also very expensive and takes a lot of time, but exploring the potential for new data standards um, is important if there's desire and capacity there to co-design with community-based organizations. And this might not end up in the creation of new standards at all. It might just end up in you know creation of crosswalks to really facilitate translation between different data standards that already exist. And yeah, thank you all. I just really wanted to, to end in conclusion with the idea that, and the fact that environmental data is generated by communities should really reach its full potential. And right now it's not. Um, and it really should work for those communities in ways that matter most. So in decision-making, to, to maintain accountability with industry and really to improve evidence-based policymaking. Um, our proposed recommendations really just target EPA and make existing EPA processes more effective at achieving their mission that they're already working towards and serving the public. Um, you can read the full memo on FAS's website and uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Saying thank you all for your presentation. As you can see, I've magically transformed and now I am online. <laughs> um, Yes, I I am looking for our next speaker, but thankfully we're presenting together, so I'm going to be able to take on this, but um, it seems like he was having some technical difficulties joining, so it'll be, be my sign. So I'm going to pull up my slides. One second. Go to the program and try to filter by date. It gets better. Yeah. Then you can scroll down. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that'll be good. We're we're gonna do some work to try to track Jeff down to see if he can help out with the Q and A. But let's for now. I'm gonna get us started so we can use everyone's time here in the most uh, effective way possible. 
So alongside, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the policy proposal that Jeff and myself worked on, um, which is an office of co-production at the National Institutes of Health. So just a little bit, this is the oh, why, who is FAS slide, uh, which is helpful to kick off this session if I hadn't been uh, in a vehicle. Um, but just who we, we are, we work to bridge um, science and technology fields with people in the federal government who are looking to make significant uh, impact and change on all topics of science, engineering, technology. And so uh, where we start, you know, how does a, how does a nuclear organization get to co-produce health research? Um, it was a real kind of inspiration from our founders who had created all of these different technologies and innovations and yet were concerned about how they were going to be used by the federal government um, in terms of kind of the ongoing Cold War. And so the goal was to ensure that these technologies were well controlled, well regulated um, to promote science and to ensure that scientists and scientific research had a freedom and, and integrity. And so we continue to do this work and inspired um, about over 200 policy proposals, some of which again are featured today in this open science event uh, to work on um, how to uh, solve some of these really key problems. And I think community engagement and public engagement is a, a big thorny problem that government and researchers are really um, thinking about in this current age to, to build a more equitable scientific enterprise. So I do, I'm going to keep checking throughout this presentation to see if my, my colleague can join, but just a little bit about us. Um, so I'm uh, our health equity policy manager, as I said, um, by background, I'm a biomedical engineer, and I did work um, working with patient uh, advocacy groups to talk to them about their roles in biomedical innovation. And then on the, on the flip side, I actually went and talked to a bunch of um, incubators for biotech and kind of found this misaligned incentives where you know, patients want to play a role, want to shape research, want to be involved, have things that they actively want to work on. And the people who are actively shaping biotech companies don't have any processes in place for how to actually bridge and engage these excited and engaged patient reps. So it's like a early stage uh, way that the, I was brought to this work and able to collaborate with Jeff on this memo. Um, and then I think my, my colleague Jeff um, is a kind of incredible patient advocate, um, quite involved in early, a lot of work around ACT UP and AIDS advocacy. And in terms of kind of getting interested in co-production, uh, Jeff was one of the founding members of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, uh, serving on its governing board. This institute was founded by taxpayer dollars in the state to do stem cell research that was at that time in the early 2000s banned by the federal government. And this was a really innovative structure in that because it was funded by taxpayers, there was high representation of community uh, and public and patients on the board that then had levels of you know, ability to oversee the grant making of the agency and actually um, be a part of the doing and funding of science. And so Jeff from there kind of had been working on co-production for a while when we connected um, to do this work together. So that's just a little bit about us and the best uh, way I can describe my colleagues work. Um, but I think the inspiration behind our proposal and I think the session in general is this idea of the need to be built infrastructure for public participation. We build infrastructure for our tools. We build infrastructure for um, you know, research data gathering. We build infrastructure for animal models and biomedical research. But currently to this point and to this date, there's not a succinctive funded grant program that supports public engagement. Um, and that's I think where we wanted to really narrow in on as a place for policy uh, innovation. And I think this work uh, is kind of really inspired by, by these principles and by these theories and how the public actually comes in to add to research in a way that isn't able to be captured just by scientific researchers. And so um, part of this work is shaped around five principles that I've again learned a lot from 
my colleague Jeff, you know, this idea of power and power sharing, uh, how people are able to uh, shape the process and not just be a part of the process. Um, this idea of perspective. So research teams, like you want to make sure in a biomedical research project, you got you got your engineers, you got your biotechnicians, you have your statisticians, you have your clinicians, but not about the role of the public or the patient. Um, those folks aren't often brought on to our teams in order to provide their unique perspectives and skills, but only they bring the knowledge of lived experience of their health care syndromes or uh, illnesses, and that cannot be captured without that um, important role. The importance of valuing all of those knowledges. So, you know, we when we talk about evidence, what are we thinking about as evidence? Is it only evidence gathered from scientific research, or could living and lived experience and lived knowledge actually be potentially considered of equal importance and be an inspiration to what we fund and why we fund it? Reciprocity, everybody working together, collaborating, and then finally, the importance of relationships. Um, relationships as infrastructure, relationships as capital, um, and important hey, to actually making sure people um, are involved in. I was looking at completing oh. my project management certificate, um, oh. but oh. not pay for it. Um, but two of them I'm sorry, I someone is on one of them is a two day course, but it's a Saturday and a oh. Sunday, April 27th and 28th. And is there a way we can mute day. someone who is currently speaking? Maybe. It would just be Sprock Kids and Lamp. And oh, I don't know how to mute everyone. Virginia, please mute yourself. Mm -hmm. oh. um, well, anyways, back into the presentation. Um, and do respectful of time. Kind of try to get a brief picture of what would an Office of Co-Production look like? Now this memo is written within the context of the National Institutes of Health, but could be done at many other scientific agencies. Um, so we, as we think about co-production, we're able to think about it as a, this trans uh, research institute resource. Um, and what do you actually need to build that existing capacity for co-production? Um, in our memo, we talk about the need for resources and training. Uh, how do researchers effectively collaborate and how does the public effectively contribute? Um, ways to build and integrate patient advocates into all of the different ways that um, the NIH decides on its research agendas, its granting, um, evaluation, data management. There's of all boards that scientists play a role in, but there's roles for the patient voice and perspective to be integrated in. You just need to have a, a coordinated ability to place those people where they might be most advised uh, and in a most expert advisory role. There's a need to then to establish an actual set of principles and practice. Um, this is done by the United Kingdom, has a great program that was run for many years and now it's integrated into their research, biomedical research infrastructure called INVOL. And what they did was to actually design how they were going to do the work of co-production and then brought it into grant requirements, assessment, building the relationships, finding the funding to support people to actually engage in research. And that allows for you to actually have something uh, to evaluate yourself on as you're building out a co-production program. Uh, a policy shop to actually ensure that public engagement at the NIH is monitored, coordinated, and evaluated across all of the institutes. And then one of the ideas, and this is in the works of the NIH, but could be done in a more systematic way, is a kind of co-production center of excellence, which would then allow for um, the practices development, the methods development, um, for then broader integration and scale into uh, NIH funded research. So, oops. And then, yeah, what would it offer in closing? Um, the co production would broaden public engagement um, and really do that by actually having a central coordinating body that would allow for trust building between researchers and the public. Um, by having a standard method and a, a set of procedures that would ensure that patients are uh, voices are at the table and in a way that they can actually shape the process and aren't just there for a checkbox or a, a mark on the researcher's agenda. It would actually help researchers as they're doing this work 
to um, anticipate the risks of the products. And as biomedical research evolves, uh, many new therapies are coming down the pike that are transformative, but also carry inherent risk. And the mRNA vaccine is a perfect example of if you had a more sustained public involvement and ability to kind of see public values in the research, potentially could have actually mitigated and avoided some of the vaccine hesitancy issues and sort of underrepresented and minoritized uh, in the uninvested populations we saw in the vaccine rollout. And the final thing is we talk a lot in biomedical research, and I know it's relevant to other fields around, you know, lack of diversity in clinical trials, lack of representation in our research, lack of representation in the data. Yes, that is a thing that can be, you know, you, know, you can do diversification, you can recruit those people. But part of this is actually if you bring people along and you engage them in this entire process and make them dedicated partners, um, you actually could accelerate research because you have people who are willing to trust you, relate with you, and work with you um, to involve uh, long trial designs, recruitments, and analysis, and get products actually out there faster to people that need them. So... Happy to, to share this idea and was not um, the way I planned to present it, but you know, this day has gone a very different way than I expected. So thank you all for um, listening to both of our talks. And uh, with our remaining 16 minutes, I wanted to open the floor to questions for myself, uh, Amelia and Katie to discuss the ideas that we put forward today. Um, and if people need inspiration, I can start us out. But I wanted to see if anyone has any questions. I wish there was a way to mute everyone. I just got to. I'm gonna go figure that out while I wait for brave people to ask questions. I figured it out. I'm a, I'm a genius. I'm kidding. Um, Sarah, what's your first question? <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I work in publishing, and this, this talk is a bit upstream of what we do, but um, do you see any implications around co-produced and co-owned data for when pa papers based on these data sets finally do make it into, into publication? You know, uh, the conflict between data being completely available for some minute undergirds of study versus respecting, say, indigenous sovereignty around how that data was collected and who owns it. That's a great question. Katie or Amelia, I feel like you guys have this and I can respond. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, you're asking if there are what implications co-produced co knowledge has for, for journals and other kinds of scientific publications. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there there's a need for for a kind of change in how journals um, both. I mean, I think there already has been a shift in recognizing the value of data and um, increasing citations of data and, and, and published articles. Um, I think there is an opportunity there because there's already been this shift um, in figuring out how we can also acknowledge uh, people who have participated in, in this kind of co-production. Um, I don't necessarily have any specific recommendations for it, um, but we have seen a number of publications recently where there have been, uh, you know, there's co-authorship from community members, um, even if they don't have, you know, an, an academic background uh, or affiliation. Um, we've talked with a few people on our network who are interested in trying to get, uh, this is a little bit, uh, I guess, more upstream, but, you um, trying to get uh, uh, their universities um, and other academic institutions to recognize co-authorship for dissertations, particularly when graduate students are, are uh, leading or participating in collaborative science projects. Um, but I, I would, if you haven't heard of the, the CARE principles, this isn't necessarily a recommendation for how to cite data, but um, the CARE principles for indigenous uh, data sovereignty are a great place to start. Um, and a lot of people are doing quite a bit of work around trying to translate those into, uh, you know, actual practices. Um, they're kind of a, uh, a supplement, I guess you could call them to the fair principles. They, they talk more about responsibility and ethics and collective benefit 
Um, so there are there are frameworks that exist. Um, I don't know of any specific ways of doing this yet with with data citations um, or or journals yet. But I think those are good places to start. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I would also just point to another resource that might be adjacent to what you're asking, but the Clear Lab um, has made kind of this wonderful guide to like author equity order um, and including people. So um, including different kinds of people and anybody that kind of contributed. And I think that that could be um, including of like data producers and data contributors. So yeah, and the final piece, I'll add is just even grant programs that have some set that are talking about, you know, community engaged research or where there's an interest in engaging the community in the science that you actually put them on the grant and they have money in the grant. So then that actually would enable those individuals to um, be engaged and involved long enough in the research and have stake in the research to then make their way onto publication. So. Oh yeah, Clear Lab. I love Clear Lab. <laughs> I just see y'all post them. They're great. <laughs> Amazing. Other questions? Don't be shy. Everyone here is really friendly and very flexible <laughs> to answer your questions. And I'm curious, yeah, especially with everyone's backgrounds, like knowing people are here from who do research, but also are part of the or publishing, like open to wherever you all want to learn more about these policies. Seeing if there's anything in the chat. If Can I ask a question of you, Grace? <laughs> yeah, please, please do. So you talked about a center of excellence and I, I was kind of re-going through the um, EPA a few weeks ago, maybe a month released their updated equity action plan. Um, and they talked about a new center of excellence for community science. Um, and I'm cool. curious, I, I know that's like, I think it's only a year, maybe less than a year old. I'm actually not sure, but I'm curious if if you're aware of what they're doing there, if it might have any, any lessons for doing something similar with NIH. Yeah, I have looked at that, but only at a high level. So that's yeah. definitely a place I would love to look. And even just like having a better network of where people are experimenting with community engagement is a, a definitely a needed resource. Um, the, yeah, I, I would need to know more. And I know that that um, EPA has probably a, a, enough history too on um, citizen science and community science to actually be able to really have that center set up. Um, the one thing I know at the NIH, which might be interesting to all of you, is they have the Compass program, where they're directly funding community-based organizations to address issues around the social determinants of health. It's a new program. It's experimental. It just started in 2023. Um, and the hope is that maybe they lead to more um, better coordinating on at least research that's led by community. And then that's a step in the direction of upholding like, community interests and values or just as valuable of, as researchers in terms of producing new insights in biomedical research. So, but yeah, I wish there was, yeah, a network to share those lessons and best practices would, would be really awesome. Cool. I do have some prepared questions. Um, so I might throw one out there to us, even though I'm a part of asking, almost asking myself to answer it too. Uh, but what are what are some of the existing you know hurdles to implementing the recommendations that you will, that we have put forward? Um, where might there be a roadblock, uh, or where might there be things that we need to get more um, buy-in, or before they can actually find their way into full implementation? Amelia, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, as Katie kind of talked about in her presentation, there are a lot of hurdles. Um, Interagency coordination is a lot easier said than done. Um, and it requires a lot of relationship building and it requires time. And that often doesn't really match up with the timelines of agencies or elections. Um, and so that's one massive hurdle. Um, I think that there's also thinking about time. There's also a real sense of urgency 
that I think these agencies should take seriously in that, you know, there are different timelines for communities, government and academics. And so uh, managing all of those timelines and like each other's perception of time, I, I think that's a huge hurdle. I also think that Katie and I were talking about this yesterday about how capacity building is often a lot of like culture change um, and like a lot of like administrative justice is, can be built into there. So it's more than just, you know, creating a new office, but, you know, that office is full of people and like, you know, how those people do their work matters. Um, and yeah, there are many more. Katie, do you want to, you want to talk about any? Yeah, I guess it's it's not a, a hurdle yet, but something that we are very aware of in this uh, election year is what might happen if the administration changes. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the, the Tanawanda example earlier on. Um, that really, one of the main reasons it was successful is because it got attention from the White House, the Obama administration and several senators really decided that this was uh, an important issue. Um and, you know, there was a, a, a mass exodus from the EPA when Trump was elected. Um, since Biden has been elected, there has been kind of a, a renewed energy and momentum there um, that, you know, the funding doesn't necessarily go away overnight if the Biden administration isn't, uh, you know, elect, reelected next year. But uh, there could be a lot of changes that would put a lot of this kind of momentum at risk. So it's something that we, we think about quite a bit. Um, and it's definitely not something that we can take for granted, I think. Definitely. I think that's that, that future proofing these recommendations for another administration is definitely something I've been really considering in my broader work on how the public is engaged in science and um, especially you know, knowing that executive orders for to expand public participation, to ensure equity, to have justice 40, those easily can be wiped away in a different administration. And so um, yeah, I think future proofing has been really on my mind as well as broadening the stakeholders that are bought in to this. So gone co-produced my biomedical research. It's a different tenor. You know, the NIH does have bipartisan support. It's probably more along the lines of like, how might I, how might you spin this argument um, for, you know, Involving the public and patients isn't going to slow your research down. It actually might save you lots of money um, when you lead to a trial later down the line that is under enrolled and you have long wait times to get device or new technologies, drugs actually to market. So that's definitely something that's been on my mind. And then I think, yeah, another thing is just like, you know, these research um r d institutes are being asked to do a lot so ask and researchers are being asked to do a lot so then having researchers be capable and prepared to do effective community engagement is a whole new set of training that we need to be providing um and you know a whole professional class on community engagement could be created and i think there's a generation of researchers that are wanting to do this work but they do need to have that support if they want to make those into actual long-term careers. So, yeah. Don, maybe we'll take your question and then we might need to we'll move towards closing, but yeah, ask. Actually, yes, thank you very much for the presenters. Uh, and the last comment you said actually just caught me. Yes, yes, training is all, on, especially on the researchers, on other people are using this data is probably extremely necessary. But my question was actually for Katie, and that was like, like, what exactly is your pitch to these agencies? Like, like, what, what are you, what are you trying to, how do you, what, how do you sell them on the idea? And, and do you have like a smallest step that you're trying to get done just to advance it? So I think, I think we, we've, I don't want to say they, they're already sold, but within EPA, there's definitely interest in co-production and in taking community perspectives and information seriously. I think this is one of the reasons that we feel optimistic about our memo in particular um, you know, Amelia mentioned the the new Office of Environmental Justice and uh, External Civil Rights. They are hiring a lot of a lot of regional staff. They I mentioned this, you know, Community Science Center of Excellence. So there is a lot of work being done there. I think the pitch is is thinking about how what they're doing um, can kind of instead of putting extra burden on communities to figure out how to work within their system is making it as easy as possible for people to 
to figure out the process and, and get their information where it needs to go. We've talked a lot about relationship building, and that's really, really important and key. It also is not necessarily accessible to every community equally. You know, the, coming back to the Tonawanda example, that's a majority white community. Communities doing similar work in Louisiana have have not been able to, you know, to have the same kind of success. So how do we make sure that communities, no matter no matter what the majority race is there, no matter what level of income and affluence um, is in a community, how can we make sure all of them have have access? So I think there's there's a lot of conversations to be had yet with EPA about taking they are taking equity and justice seriously, but how do you actually put that into action? Um, I don't know if I actually answered your question about like the smallest step, but um, yeah, I think they they are taking steps. I think that is true. I, mean, I don't know, Amelia, if you want to add on to that. I mean, I think the small step is a lot of the work that OEDP is doing with like the C Commons Network, you know, like I think that, you know, training researchers to do community engagement is a lot of what our the data facilitators consortium trainings will be. And so not to pitch our own work, but um, yeah, I think we're, we're starting those small steps and baby steps. Amazing. Oh, I see there's two questions. Uh, rapid fire? Winona, is it a comment question? We can try to do it. We are near our time, but. Sure. And I <clears throat> Thanks for taking my um, my question. Um, I work at NASA Ames Research Center. I'm just um, oh, a, awesome! Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm a, a research scientist, um, underfunded, <laughs> but also you know doing a lot of um, other academic or um, administrative sort of support, which is good. But my question is, I, I see that you were mentioning an MOU among agencies and I'm curious what the process and if you have points of contact because um I I would be interested in helping facilitate we do have our own small team for open science at Ames but I do seem it does seem sort of fragmented and so if there's a way to integrate and if there's any any like direction that you can provide on how to facilitate that that would be great to hear I think the the OEJ ECR is probably a good place to start. They're still hiring a lot right now. Um, I think I know they're in the middle of kind of a, a hiring sprint, so I don't know who the specific point of contact there would be. Um, I'm not sure, Amelia, if you have other suggestions for places or people to start with. Yeah, I think that looking at some of the recent examples, Grace, you shared that MOU with us that you had been looking at. So like kind of modeling from other examples that have brought together many agencies um, in the past and, and taking those small steps. But honestly, that's, that's kind of an area that we would need to do a little bit more research on the exact process. Um, but I mean, great to hear that you're you're in support. Yeah, I would love to follow up too if you're interested in talking more later. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Amazing. I was doing that's yeah. I mean, feel free, everyone. I can I can share emails in the chat. I'll put mine in if anyone wants to chat with me. I'm um for folks on the call and agencies where and beyond, we are at FAS, we're looking at public participation um in research and development. We're doing a project on broader strategies and capacity building needs that the federal government could be investing in, and this is building off of the incredible work that we were able to incubate in the open science policy sprint. Um, so more, more to come and just think this is a great emerging field and so much to do and so much to learn. Um, and I am happy that you all joined us today. Um, and I just am inspired by everyone who's been a part of this. Um, Jeff, Katie, Amelia, um, Gwen Ottinger, who wasn't able to join us. Hey, it, it was really <laughs> it's really an awesome session, a really awesome yeah. play, like opportunity. So this is so funny. I have just so many kids. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thank you all. Um, just yeah, I am um, happy to keep talking and hope this is a great <laughs> session for everyone here. So thank you again um, for being here for for our talks. Thank you, Grace. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Awesome. Too bad Jeff couldn't join. It was I was hoping to to talk I with know. him. But <laughs> yeah. I know. I was okay. It's a uh, the the platform is like once you get the hang of it, I think I like it's fairly easy, but it's just like a different setup. I think there's <laughs> 
a bunch of like different a couple setups. extra steps. Yeah, but it it looks cool. <laughs> it looks really. I mean, it's great. I. I was able to navigate it on my phone. Oh, um, yeah. So yes. people are hovering, but yeah, if you want to, I'm happy to stand a little bit more. I do need to. No, we can let you go. Minutes. Just wanted but... to say thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. And thank you. It just, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was coming from the Eisenhower office building. Yeah. There for, yeah. So, well, yeah. Anyways. No, you're, it sounds like you're doing a lot of good work. So no worries. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for moderating. I think you did great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm happy to also follow. Yeah. I know we haven't met since your memo got published. So if you would like to like meet again and chat and sure. yeah. see also some of the new, yeah. I'm happy to share some more of this workshop that we're doing and the research we're doing. Absolutely. And... Cool. Definitely. Okay. I'm going to go. Okay. Thanks. Guys. Yeah. See you later. Bye everyone. Thank Bye. you.